All right, thank you so much for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Bree Hogue and I'm the manager of Powell City of Books here in Portland, Oregon. You can keep up to date on our events at powells.com and follow along on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Tonight, we are really excited to welcome Suyi Davies Okumbawa and Shannon Chakraborty. Suyi is a Nigerian author of speculative fiction inspired by his West African origins. He is the author of David Mogo, God Hunter. His shorter works have appeared in Light Speed, Nightmare, Strange Horizons, and other periodicals and anthologies. His new novel, Son of the Storm, is a sweeping tale of the violent conquest and forgotten magic set in a world inspired by the pre-colonial empires of West Africa. In the ancient city of Basa, Danso is a clever scholar on the cusp of achieving greatness, only he doesn't want it. Drawn into the city's hidden history, he sets out on a journey beyond its borders, and the chaos left in the wake of his discovery threatens to destroy the empire. Tonight, Su Yi is joined in conversation with Shannon Chakraborty. Shannon is the author of the critically acclaimed and internationally best-selling Devabad trilogy. She has her work has been translated into over a dozen languages and nominated for the Locus, World Fantasy, Crawford, and Astounding Awards. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A, so if you have a question for either author, click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and we'll get to it at the end of the event. You can support Suyi and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. I'll share a link of the book, um, Son of the Storm at Powell's.com, along with Shannon's books, a few times in the chat tonight. So click on the chat button to see those links and also to be in conversation with the other participants. Suyi, Shannon, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to welcome you both to the Powell's virtual stage. Thank you for having us. <laughs> So, um, Shannon, would you? Um, yes, I will introduce you in your fabulous <laughs> book. Um, <laughs> that broke me and traumatized my soul. This is how I sell things to people. Uh, but first, um, I why don't you give us a taste of the book and read a little bit? Okay, um, I'm just going to reach for my copy over here. Um, uh, let's see. So often when I read like this, I often like to read something that's like... Uh, um, embody like that, that's an embodiment right of the work in itself um, but something short hopefully and, uh, so I will go for a scene that's not actually uh, featuring any of the main characters uh, maybe because again this all, all, often helps introduce uh, a situate us in like in this world uh, and so the character I'm, I'm going to be talking about reading about today is um, Zach right so I'm reading from chapter seven um, so just a bit of <laughs> Uh, a bit of like, uh, what's the word, um, context. So Zach is a second, right, to the main character whose name is Danso, right? This uh, mm -hmm. looking person here, <laughs> this person here, um, Danso is the main character in the novels. Danso is a scholar, right? And in this world, um, Zach is Danso's second. A second is like a um, sort of aid, but also like protector, you know, um, sort of, you know, just a second, right? Okay. <laughs> um, but Zach is also like an immigrant, right? In this city of Vasa where Danso lives uh, and is a part of a lower caste as a result. And, and um, this scene features Zach going to like the local government office to like report for, um, you know, his duties. And it's like, oh, this is what I've done in the last few weeks or whatever um, to give a report. And this is the ensuing scene. The local government office of Sixth Ward was packed to the brim with people waiting to get in. Like every local government office in Bassa, it opened late, was understaffed, and the amenities were less than desirable. Hopeful visitors stood in a line and were assigned numbers by civic guards according to how soon they'd arrived. There were several lines of this sort, separate lines for new migrants, migrant assignments, and reassignments, migrants reporting performance per moon cycle, and separate lines for nation citizens who were here for matters of business like trade or specialist permits, um, trade or specialist permits, guild registration, 
or seeking redress for disputes. Zach stood at the front of a line of seconds. He always woke before dawn anyway, and was usually among the first to arrive at the office on report day. The local government officer strode in late, as always, without apology. They moved languidly, like people who weren't in the employ of the city. It took them ages to get into their seats behind their windows and roll up the fat screens. Even then, they barked at the people who tried to immediately approach them, asking for some space and time to compose themselves, despite being over an hour late. As with every time he had to be here, Zach marveled at this dedication to mediocrity. It shouldn't have surprised him at all, but each new experience was jarring. Was this the same Basa, the promised land of gold and humus? The same Basa whose emperor's names had once evoked fear and trembling in the lips that mentioned them, whether those lips belonged to mainlanders or outlanders? Stories of the nation's well-drilled armies and their demanding leadership had filled his childhood and he could not believe Basa had fallen so far from its heyday. In the discussions he overheard among Basai and immigrants alike, many believe that the lack of a succession of true ideals contributed to this. By getting rid of their emperors and opting for a parliamentarian system of councils, Basa had, in essence, become a nation without a frowning face or a striking hand. Prior to crossing the Soke border into the mainland, Zach had never compromised on three things, punctuality, efficiency, and a zeal for self-improvement. Sadly, being in Basa had caught up to him too, and he found that he waned on all three counts. He had been subsumed into becoming a part of Basa's biggest problem, which was really that the Basai thought they were too big to fail. Past glory had lured them into a sense of excessive optimism. Finally, the officer at the window in front of his line beckoned that he was ready, and Zach went and sat in front of the man. Despite it being early in the morning, the man had lit a pipe of tobacco leaves and was gently puffing on it while flipping through a sheaf of papers. He put it down and, without so much as a glance at Zach, asked for his name and date of entry. Zach offered his information, including the name of the household he was assigned to. The man flipped through the sheet some more, then pulled out a sheet and reached for a charcoal stylus. Hmm, he said, chewing on a cleaning stick whenever he put his pipe down. Zach wondered who wouldn't clean their teeth before coming to work. Back in the small town of Haruna in the Savannah Belt, where he was born before his parents moved to Chigoko in search of work, not only would omitting this simple action be deemed disrespectful, the man would be immediately removed from his position without question. Clean record so far, up until this last, this past moon cycle anyway, the man said, spitting chaff from his chewing stick into a nearby waste bowl. What happened? Zach frowned. I, I don't understand. Your charge, he said. Danso Dahaba, am I correct? Yes, Zach said. I see a report of two misdemeanors for him, the man said, which means twice you have failed to do your job. Zach gulped. It wasn't, the man put up his hand. He wasn't old, a young man, maybe 50 or so seasons, at least five or more younger than Zach. Back in Chugoko, when he was still a teacher at the primary school, this man could have been Zach's subordinate. Yet here, he wielded authority like someone who had bursted many seconds. Consider your position before you mention any excuse, the man said. Remember, I'm authorized to make comments in your report about your behavior. You wouldn't want me to write you up for insolence, would you? Zach gritted his teeth. No, officer. Then keep quiet. The man held the point of his stylus into a nearby flame to darken the charcoal. Your charge has two misdemeanors. It, make, it makes no sense that you have none since he is your responsibility. So I'm gonna put you down for one misdemeanor. The man wrote and wrote while Zach seethed. Ne never in his life had he been accused of being less than, of not doing his duty to any authority, family, occupation, state. If anything, he would be accused of doing too much 
Leaving Chigoko for the mainland was the first time in his entire life that he had gone against the wishes of anyone. And that was why, of course, he could never go back. But when he was prom promoted from house hand to second and assigned Danso as his first charge, all of his focus and steadfastness had started to veer. He was suddenly losing his virtues, sliding down the hill he'd been climbing up all his life and he was being punished for it. Once he was done, the officer straightened up, stretched his back so that the bones creaked and took another puff of tobacco. A shashi, yeah, he said and chuckled. What did you do for them to slap you with this one as charge? To be honest, Zach had asked himself this same question a number of times. He had migrated to Basa to make it and had primed himself to do what required of him as a Yelakute, but not a single thing worked out as planned. It was like Basa had passed him the one thing it couldn't handle, a young man who didn't know who he was, what he was supposed to be doing and how he was supposed to behave. How was he supposed to su succeed with that? You know what happens when you come here with another misdemeanor, yes? The officer blew smoke into Zach's face as he said this. Zach nodded. He wanted to wave the smoke away, but was unsure of what would count as disrespectful, so he just let it settle all over his face. He tried hard not to cough and annoy the man further. Good, the man said, beckoning to the next second. He looked Zach in the eye to press home the point, to twist harder the knife of his powerlessness. Because if you come here with one more misdemeanor from your charge, I'll be sending you back over the moats myself. That is a great scene. <laughs> I felt so bad for Zach. <laughs> I wanted to urge, I wanted so much better for him and I wanted to urge him <laughs> and particularly Zonso to make better life choices throughout yeah. the entire world. <laughs> um, and I love that scene because, you know what, forget all of these fancy scenes of like, you know, like imperial courts or all the magnificent world building. Show me your terrible, terrible, abusive civil, civil servants. And that will look <laughs> feel better than anything else the understanding an author has on <laughs> power dynamics and world building, you know, those itty bitty moments where it's just like, you know, that's, that's humanity and that's how people are. Um, and I loved that scene because it's just, it brought the whole thing to life. Um, but I want to start out, especially for new readers, um, to kind of, you know, start us and introduce the book. In your words, what is Son of the Storm about and what inspired it? I, I would, I'm, I'm going to borrow from a lot of the reviews I've been reading because they seem to articulate my book better than I do. <laughs> but um, I would say Son of the Storm is really a story about power. Um, it's a, it's a, fantasy, it's an epic fantasy novel set in the secondary world inspired by 15th century West African empires um, across the board. Uh, and it follows three characters, right? Danso, who's a scholar, right, in this world, and he is a storyteller. That's his training to be a storyteller. Um, but he's also straddling two castes, um, one of the lowest castes in the, in the Basai society and um, the highest one. And intended a Shemi who is also um, in this city, but is also some of sort of an outcast, based, you know, straddling two spaces because her, her mother is of a lower caste and is sort of derided because her mother is a fixer. Uh, and Ashemi is also in a council, right? With, similar to a lawyer, right? She's in council guild training to be one of, you know, the council councils in the higher cast, castes. Uh, and then third person is Lilong, who's a, a mysterious warrior from an island that shouldn't exist, or at least the Basai have sold the idea that this, this island doesn't exist. And she's pursuing this mineral that gives powers um, for her to wield. Uh, and she's sort of like, she, she has chased it into Basa. Uh, and that sort of like sets a lot of events going. So these three people are, this story is kind of about these three people, but it's also really at the core about power, about how those who want power and how the, 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 the means they employ to get them, how they decide to wield it, how, how they understand power. But it's not just about these three people. It's also about the people who orbit these three people. Zach is a good example because Zach orbits Danso and everything Danso does affects Zach in a different way. And it's, you know, it raises a lot of questions of how does Danso understand the power that he wields even when he is disenfranchised? 
How does Zach see the powers that are oppressing him and what does he do with that? How does Shemi wield the powers around her to sort of move up in the world or, or otherwise? Um, especially with her mother being a fixer and how she her mother moves within the spaces. So at the core, um, it's about how people wield power in this world that's inspired um, by um, these empires that um, were very multifaceted. And I wanted to capture the multifaceted nature of these empires, but also think about how power moves in these spaces. Uh, so whether that power is political power, whether it's magical power, whether it's socioeconomic power, um, however that is wielded um, and, and or however that is presents itself, it's we follow these characters as they make life choices that um, about how they are going to employ this power or be affected by this power um, and and what the fallouts from those are and what that means for the larger world around them. And I love that it was fascinating because you just did have characters on every different level and their own orbits of power. A lot of times them not even realizing the power they they held, oh, um, yeah. particularly between Donzo and Zach, which was just I wanted. There were times he was my favorite character. Donzo was my favorite character, but he also made me feel like such so old like a parent because I wanted to <laughs> shake him in the beginning of the book and be like, stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, I, I remember, I, yeah, I remember like um, one of the first things I wanted to do right, uh, was, um, I, I wouldn't say I even set out to subvert like the typical um, or the more normative fantasy protagonist who's always like a swashbuckling um, knight or, or someone who's like a warrior of some sort or someone who's like a master thief, you know, like we like, we love all these like larger than life characters and and Danzo is sort of larger than life in a way but he just doesn't see it that way um for the most part he considers himself like a normal person um, with these like exceptional abilities um he has like exceptional ability of memory to be able to like memorize stuff and that's why he's even in this cast anyway but for the most part he's just like trying to answer his questions and like get through life as a regular person and it's not really working because everyone's trying to remind him that you're really kind of like not regular though. So you can't do that. Like you really don't really fit into that space where you can just disappear and do whatever you want. You have to live by all these rules because this spaces you occupy, power moves through these spaces and you have to decide if that power is gonna move you or you're gonna move that power in, in some way, you know? So, um, but he's just like very scattershot because he has no guidance. Um, he has no one who has like taught him how to navigate these spaces. He's just like moving wherever the wind takes him. And, and I really wanted that. I, I wanted that because that's how most of us move through life anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I called it in praise of the hapless protagonist um, <laughs> because that's really what Danzo is hapless. Uh, and I wanted that because we often get like a lot of very competent um, protagonists. And I wanted someone who didn't really know what they were, but were Com compelling anyway well it definitely endears you to the, to him particularly by the end because you're like oh you're starting to learn <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um just a little uh, talking about epic fantasy because your first book was not epic fantasy it was you know very different in tone and modern um so what made you decide to go into epic fantasy with all its wild word counts and world building <laughs> and all of the work that gets involved what, why epic fantasy uh, i would say I, i've always read epic fantasy anyway um and i always knew that i wanted to build like a world a sort of secondary world but um i guess what really made push come to shove was was um this one time right so i, I was in about 20 so between 2014 and 2017 i was working in lagos right? i was living in lagos nigeria and i was like working uh, at this like um um consulting firm right and so i would go back like during holidays and like visit my family who lived in benin city uh, which is like in south of nigeria uh, and and it's like the city is built around this like ancient empire that used to span a large part of what is now southern Nigeria um, from east to west actually um, or from a large part of that area and and the, the kingdom was like 
massive, right? It was one of the massive ones alongside the others from Mali and, and Ghana and, mm-hmm. and the Songhai Empire and, and all of that. And so, but like post, post um, the British invasion around 1879 or so, um, um, the, the empire sort of like fell after that invasion. And what happened was um, a lot of the vestiges of the empire uh, or, or, or the kingdom itself had sort of like faded away, but they still exist. They're still in that city. Um, you just have to know where to go. And so what happens that uh, when, when I would go and visit, I'd be like, oh, you know, now I, 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 some, I would feel like, I, even if I had grown up in that city, because I grew up in Benin City, but I didn't go out and like witness these things. And so I was like, okay, I'll go this time, right? I'm an adult, you know, I'm coming on vacation to my own city. So I'm actually going to try and treat it like, um, um, like I was a tourist. And I would go into like all these far reaches. And I started to like see a lot of things that I didn't notice before. Like I'd see all these stat- statues with like the stories of the warriors written on them. They'd be half crumbling, but like they were there. Uh, or like, um, you know, half of a city wall that's still like standing or like a moat that has been filled up to a degree. And you'd see, you'd still see some like vestiges of all of these things. And it started to like really come together for me that this was like really something really, really good uh, and big then. And I started to do a lot of like reading about the Benin Kingdom. And I was like, yo, this is way too good to like, just let, you know, sit down somewhere and like, not be like, um, tapped into and like brought to life uh, and so that's where really the start of son of the storm as a, a, or like the nameless republic as a concept that's where it started coming from um, um, and most of Basa is sort of like inspired by the Benin kingdom in that way uh, and then everything else just started coming up you know otherwise um, the other parts of the world I started to think about what I would use to fill them in and I started to think about more empires that existed um, tangentially to Benin at the time, um, side by side, how would they trade? How, why would they trade? Um, what, what was migration like? What caused movement? What, you know, stuff like that. So in asking all those questions, it raised a lot of the political, socioeconomic questions of the cities and why they would do what they would do. Um, and then I, that's, of course, started to come down to the characters. Who, who could tell the story, right? Because this was a story about I think for me, when I started, it was a story about stories. So that's mm-hmm. why Danso really sticks out as the character that, that makes sense to drive the inception, because like, this is a, an empire built on stories. And someone needs to be telling those stories, even if they're not necessarily always the right ones. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and it made complete sense that a scholar would be <laughs> the best person to do that. So um, that's how I got to Danso. And then everyone else sort of like, um, you know, as I said, orbitals, I started thinking about orbitals. So who are the people that orbit these people? Um, yeah. And so that's how, that's how it came about. <laughs> That pretty much goes directly to my next question, um, speaking of stories and the making of stories, um, which is that your book falls into one of my favorite fantasy, I say tropes, but I hate the word tropes because tropes have a negative (laughs) connotation, but it's sort of, you know, you have the main character, especially often like a scholar or someone who's younger, who slowly realizes that their entire world is built on a bed of lies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the lies usually put together to you know hold up an existing oppressive political system and it's yeah. kind of like what do you do with that information and you're like wait are we the bad guys yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah, right. my entire life um <laughs> so what i mean what what i think and it's interesting because i do think we're seeing a lot of books like that lately um mm-hmm. that's something in the water in the water <laughs> global system um but what made you want to kind of look into that idea I would say, um, I would say, to start, as I said, it was a story about stories. And one of the things that I really wanted to capture, is, this is a line that I think made it into the book, is that I've always thought that stories are like knives, right? Weapons or tools, depending on who's wielding them. So, um, and I think part of this was even coming from where I was drawing from, right? Because like this empire I'm talking about has like you know disappeared, but like at a time it was like the biggest thing in its heyday. Uh, one of the facts, for instance, that I found out is like prior to, um, prior to I think pre-industrialization, um, the Benin Wall was the longest hand like man-made um, construction that didn't that was just done with hands, like no uh, mechanical support. 
right? It was all hands uh, and it was like the largest. But like, that's not a fact that you often like see get into anywhere um, because there's, there's a story that sort of like subsumes that story. And the story is that any, most things that come from that part of the world are not like worthy of attention. That's the bigger story that sort of subsumes that. So I was thinking a lot about that. Um, and that's really where, what led me to the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to talk about um, a, a, a space that wants to tell the biggest stories about itself and wants to thrive on those stories and stories alone. Like it doesn't even want to do the work of living up to the stories. It just wants to use the stories as its weapons. And that's what Basa tries to do. And then of course I wanted the protagonist to be someone who's within that and who's like going along with that because that's all they know until a point where something that is irrefutable comes in front <laughs> of them. Now, why, why, why the youth? I think that at that point, right, that, that what happens is that you're still like at that space where you're maybe impressionable to a degree and also at the same time willing to question stuff and like not have, have not been so entrenched in the ideas of safety and stability that these stories often give, right? So Danso's in that space, right? He's almost there, almost crossing the threshold because he because once he makes it into like that caste system and he's like the 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 jolly to to the to the upper council or something, you know, he's no longer like able to question anything. So he hasn't made it there yet. He's still in that space where he's still learning. And in the course of learning, he realizes that wait, these things don't <laughs> add up yo so what is happening right and he's lucky too because as i said because he straddles these spaces he actually has that part of him that is still open to asking questions and he asks a lot of them they get him in trouble he asks them again they get him in more trouble um up until the point he asks some that are way too big to come back from and and he even he knows that and he's like well i guess this is <laughs> this is the end of the line for me um but yeah <laughs> That's like the perfect summary of the first third of the book. He asks <laughs> yeah. questions and gets in trouble and he does it again and again. I loved him. He was great. Again, <laughs> wanted to yell at him, but he was great. Um, so yeah, so do you mean speaking about characters a bit? Um, because the trio is great. I love them. They all, it's, it's an, it's epic fantasy and it's built on such a large world, but at the same, and you know, politics and power, it's a very character driven story. Um, and we have this great, we, we have a great, great side characters as well, but at the heart is this trilogy of characters and they're just all so different and all so flawed and have such different <laughs> motivations. Um, but who is your favorite? Uh, who is your favorite, either your favorite you like them or your favorite to write or who is the most challenging to write? Sometimes these are all different different names. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, favorite, favorite, favorite to write, um, challenging to write. It, it's actually, um, so favorite will actually be a shemi. Um, <laughs> and I would say this, um, that's to start with because um, Ashemi didn't, wasn't even supposed to be a main character, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Ashemi started out as just Danso's intended. Um, but then there was this, like the first scene where she shows up mm -hmm. and she has so much presence and it was just impossible to like have such a character like, you know, go away. <laughs> so... Um, so, because I don't know how many of the folks listening have like read the first scene um, where they like uh, the first chapter or so, but like Shemi shows up and everyone can feel her presence. And even you as the reader, I feel like you would know. And immediately I felt this person doesn't just orbit Danso. This person is a force that moves Danso in a specific way that others don't. And I knew that, you know, such a person wouldn't just move Danso such a person will move other things. <laughs> so, and I, I guess that's really where I came from. Uh, and, and I just like kept unearthing a new layer every time she moved something. And that's what she ends like, she, she is a mover, <laughs> right? And that's really what I love. Uh, it was like really exciting to just like always be thinking, what is a Shemi thinking? Yeah. Um, and then, and then the challenge, the, the, the favorite, my favorite character is Danzo because <laughs> Because he's so conflicted, complicated. Um, even like even when he's sure, he's not sure. And then when he's unsure, you're like, you should be sure. So it's like <laughs> every time he's a contradiction, he's a, like living, walking, talking contradiction. And everybody he comes in contact with is telling him this. Zach is like, dude, pay attention. Shemi is like, pay attention. 
you know, like everyone is his father, his uncles, everyone's like, what are you doing, boy? Um, the readers. Some, <laughs> yeah, the readers, exactly. Everyone's like, what are you doing? But like, I think the thing is he, he just gravitates towards what he gravitates towards. And I think like that's one of the allures, right? So I was like, I guess one thing I always ask myself is, there is a situation right here. What is Dan so gravitating toward? Um, in the, you know, it could be something as simple as he just at this moment feels like this is a good time to write a story and he starts writing it and everything outside of that is like moot. Even if that thing is as important as say an impromptu meeting at the Great Dome, he's like, well, you know, story, Great Dome, you know, like, mm. and you know, he just like does what he does. And I think I liked that about the character. Um, and I tried as much as possible to try, like, not make it too much. So, like, you're not like, oh, this dude again. Um, and I think there, there might have been some points like that. But um, uh, where, where I think it started to really come to terms for me was, like, how does he sort of come back from that? How does he start to come back from that? But also retain some of that part of us, part of him that makes us like him. So it was, it was nice. I, I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, so he's kind of, like, my favorite to do in that way. The most challenging character was actually Lilong because um, when a character um, comes from, I think like Lilong as a character is like driven by a lot of anger, a lot of trauma, trauma, especially that's not necessarily physical to her. It's generational, right? It's something, it's an erasure that has been passed down. And so coming from such a place and Lilong as a person is situated specifically in a place that is like teeming with enemies, pretty much everyone is an enemy. And it's very easy to like let this character descend into like this well of anger that every time they speak, every word out of their mouth is filled with rage. Um, and I, I always had to keep reminding myself that Lilong is still a person, right? Sometimes she's not angry actually, you know, she might be angry like somewhere, but like right now as she's speaking to Danso, maybe she's still a human being. And I always had to keep doing that. Um, and then I also had to think about why she would come to become friends with Danso or even trust him or care what he thinks. And that journey was one I had to keep, keep interrogating. I kept interrogating it over and over until we got to the point where I could be like, okay, I think you now as a character, she has gotten to this point where she can be comfortable with Danso because their relationship is crucial to the momentum and direction of the narrative um, as a whole, but also for their narratives like coming together. So yeah, so it kind of like moves across three of them. <laughs> and I like that, I actually liked that it took so long for just these inklings of friendship to start because that felt real. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're readers and we can go into a story and be like, okay, if they're from opposite sides, we each get a perspective, we know they're going to become allies or whatever, but you want, you want the reader to work for that um, and yeah. to kind of really make it feel real. So I, I liked that. I liked how just utterly distrustful she was. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, I did have to ask though, um, without spoiling things, because it, first of all, it, it makes complete sense that Ashemi showed up that she was supposed to just be like the side character and then insisted that she was sent <laughs> the narrative like <laughs> if you have not read the book yet that is that character just summed up like she would do that just step off this page and i'm here <laughs> now um i i really i mean I, I hesitate to say like her because she <laughs> speaking about power <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying not to start with her. um but she is so ruthless you cannot help but admire it where you know it's just not <laughs> Not kind of like every once in a while you know what you like to see a character like that and as I was reading it I was like I hope I'm gonna not have to hear nonsense about like oh she's an unlikable female character because that's all <laughs> you have to do with her um you know she's she's power for her she will discard anything um and she makes a decision and I'm not gonna spoil it I've, I told myself 10 times before starting this um but one that I don't think I've ever seen in fiction um okay. and one that I found I found shocking and, but it fit the character, but I'm just curious, I don't know if there's a way to ask that without spoiling, spoiling <laughs> things, but um, did you, were you kind of going in that direction of knowing what, you know, there's something she can't quite take that back. Um, and yeah. that sets her in a certain direction, I think, that we don't usually see from characters. We certainly don't see from female characters. Um, so without 
<laughs> so like, that's what it is. What were some of your thoughts about the direction of her character? Shemi was like um, someone who I just thought um, all I needed to do was, was um, drop her in a situation yeah. and just like watch things play out. Uh, and, and somehow the, I, I, I thought of her as like the inevitable character where you would drop her in a situation and just almost inevitably, you know, she would, you know, step out of this situation and probably with everything behind her in like ruins and fire. Yeah. Um, so like that meme where someone like walks away and like everything's yeah. burning, that's a shame. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and, and so it was more a case of like, who would be a worthy adversary to this woman? That, that's actually <laughs> what I kept thinking about. I was like, so who? And so what happens is unlike say Danso and Lilong who are like really thinking about survival um, and, and in a survival mindset, um, it's more like elemental, right? Oh, we're going to chase by this thing or chase by these people, right? For Shemi, it was more like you have to put her in an arena each time with someone. There was always someone she had to dance in an arena with and someone was always going to come out of that scathed. Um, it was not often her, even when she always seemed like she had the least of weapons, but somehow she just managed to borrow a lot from her mother who didn't think maybe that her daughter was learning a lot, but somehow she was. <laughs> um, and then she would come out at the other end. And, and so I guess it was always like, so who? Um, and so one of the things is that one of the main advers uh, her, her main adversaries in the book, I sort of like wanted to build up to when she actually meets with that person because they meet in the beginning and you know that, oh, this is gonna be bloody if they meet again. Uh, and then when they end up meeting, it doesn't turn out well. Um, and, and that's like the culmination of like, you have drawn a line, you have really drawn a line here. Uh, and so I wanted to like lead up to that. So I started to place all these various people she has to like engage with, right? Some of them are like low level, but, um, because they have some other powers that she doesn't like, she's not physically, she's not a warrior. She can't fight. She doesn't even have a second because she sends her second away and she doesn't even have someone like guarding her, but she makes power moves because she makes power moves to ensure that everything she's lacking is shored up. So when she say is placed like, you know, in an arena with someone who has physical power, she knows she can't take up this person. So she wields some other power that she can to get someone who will do that for her. Um, and she does that like very intricately in like one step, two step. Um, and so, yeah, it was more of that process. I was like, so who doesn't, who has something she doesn't that will force her to make a power move? Um, and that's pretty much what she ends up doing. She makes one move to the other and the moves just keep like getting bigger, right? It's like this chess moves where you're like, you're just like making bigger and bigger and bigger moves. And then the very last move she makes is like, there's no coming back from that. Um, mm -hmm. So, and so she just, and she knows that she sees that. Um, and I guess that's a good time too, where uh, she gets like a lot of, I wouldn't call it encouragement, but it's kind of encouragement from her like mother to like go that like final stretch. And she does, she like goes for it hard and comes out in a place that, I mean, it should be scary. Should it be scary? Uh, it it should, scary. <laughs> I would say it should be scary, but like, you know, I don't know why you be, you'd be cheering is all I would say. I was cheering. I was like, yay. But I was like, this is not good though. I'm like, so this is so not good. So <laughs> yeah. I was like, but this is not good though. Um, and I think it doesn't really come to the fore until like you see how it affects, because like a lot of things are playing out like on a grand scale, but when you start to see how it affects Danso and Lilong especially, and especially the, the, the side characters they have built into their unit as friends, then you start to see why this isn't really good, a good thing. But at the same time, you're like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know, so, and I kind of wanted that so um yeah that was really my thought process for going through the motions with the shemi what was great I mean the tension was just spot on because for you go back at by the end of the book and you're like wait these two were gonna they were intended for each they other they were intended to get married <laughs> of like dynamite thrown into a volcano <laughs> yeah and it was great because as they go on their separate arcs, you know, Danso's learning and, and, you know, he's, he's growing a bit more of a heart and just a better understanding of the world. And Shemi is becoming <laughs> coming into her own. 
Um, and you know it's going to circle back, and it's just yeah. great tension because as this this continues to go, you're just like, oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> this is going to be explosive, and it was just it was excellently done. Um, thank so you. thank you for my racing heart when I was reading the book. Um, and I think we're going to be moving to Q and A for a second, but just a question I like to ask all writers is. What are you reading now? Um, do you have anything to recommend? Uh, you know, what other books coming out are you excited about? Yeah, um, so I'm reading two things, um, but this is ahead of like a panel mm -hmm. I'm going to be working on with P. J. D. Clark. So the book I'm reading is A Master of Gin, yes. um, <laughs> which is J. D. Clark's new book. book. Came out at the same time, as same day as my book. Brilliant, right? Brilliant. Um, I mean. Jenny Clark has like always been like a must, um, just like instant pick read for me often. I read Ring Shout last year and it was like awesome. So this um, um, night, alternate 1920s Cairo, Egypt, steampunk, uh, a detective who dresses in the most dapper way possible. So like, it's like all the good things, right? Um, and then um, Cadwell Turnbull's No Gods, No Monsters, same panel. I'm also reading, I'm gonna, gonna be work, uh, reading that. I'm looking forward to reading that next. Um, and so, yeah, these are two books I would say if you could pick up, pick them up. Good. <laughs> um, and then I think if Powell- We do have questions, yeah. We do have questions. I think what? there are questions in the in chat, yeah. Oh, we, I don't think we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <Okay>. Thank you. <laughs> Were there changes in the natural environment, such as the degradation of the forest into savanna in the oral history record of West Africa, or did you make it up? It seems that a clued out elite and a degrading <laughs> earth is a very allegorical for our times. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey, for that question. That was like, that is a vital question. Um, so when I said I was thinking about how people thought about um, migration, like why, why did the people of those empires move at the time? Why did they trade, right? Some of the reasons they did were environmental reasons. So in, um, in Son of the Storm, right? Basa is like the place that's flush and green, right? It has all, it has everything, right? Uh, and the and the northern part, right, the desert doesn't have as much. So like a lot of migration is because of desertification, right? The resources in the desert are like dwindling and people are moving into Basa. And then Basa is like, uh, no, 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 we don't want anyone here because like that's way too much on our resources. So you stay over there. And that's what starts like a lot of move, um, issues. Um, but at the same time, Basa is paying so much attention and keeping people out, keeping up all these stories about its might and everything that's forgetting that. Um, does education just doesn't happen in one place at a time, right? It's also happening where they are, but they're not paying attention. And it has, it's someone who, like, like even Danzo, who's a scholar, doesn't know this because no one teaches him, right? He, he learns, one of the subjects he learns is earth studies, but like none of that contains the current issues that are happening. Instead, it's about like how Basa is like, you know, all the good stuff, right? Everything still points towards like the, the greatness of Basa. Um, it's Lilong actually who points out, it's like, did, did, didn't you know that that place like is no longer a forest? Did you know that? And he's like, that's not true. And they're like, girl, you're lying. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then she's like, no, really. And then she draws out the map and the spot that is, has like um, lost the trees. It has, is slowly changing into the savannah where savannah shouldn't be because they're supposed to be rainforest. Uh, but she can know that because she comes from a place that is um, so the islands um, in, in, in the lore of Basa have been, you know, plagued by um, this, the, the never ending sea, right? Because Un, the continent where everything is situated is one continent. And so the seas are is always eating away at the islands. So the islanders are like way more attuned to nature, like um, the, 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 the relationship between them and the way nature moves and works, right? Meanwhile, the Basai are just like in this one place that they don't travel from, they don't move. And so they just like think everything is like forever, right? And so that, that presence of mind is what she brings. And, and I don't think there were words in the, in the research I did. I don't think they had the words to say those things. I, didn't, I don't think they were like climate change or like environmental degradation, but they definitely were like, there was no water 
you know, the, the water had dried up and so we moved, right? The, the, they, they would say stuff like um, the crops no longer gave, you know, the right um, yield and so we moved, right? The rivers that used to pass through our, our settlements no longer pass through. There were, the rains were less, right, than they were. So they would describe it in all these forms, but pretty much I started to realize that that's what they were saying. And, and, and that's kind of like why I wove it into. And even if it's not like a central thing, it's key to why they, people make moves in the world, at least, even if it's not like front and center of the story. Thank you for that. Um, that is sort of related to this other question. What is your starting point when you are working on your world building? Oh, <laughs> what is my starting point? <laughs> you have to trace <sighs> back now. <laughs> Let's see. Um, for this book, this book took a different um, pattern because this book started from something much closer to home. Um, I think, but if I was to be more descriptive of my process, I think I always start with the one thing that, I always ask myself, what is different? The, what's the one thing that's different? And then I sort of like build most things around that one thing. Because I found that what makes a world richer is how things adjust to certain things. So a good example, for instance, is um, someone who's making, making a point some at some point about masks right about how say 20 years in the future um maybe for instance we're like way advanced and we've like been we are able to wipe out virus like covid viruses like covid um you know outrightly without having to like go through this like pandemics and stuff and maybe we showed photos and we're like oh you know back in the day we used to wear these masks uh, but there was this particular photo though that was someone wearing a mask, but it was during the time of the California fires and the skies were like orange and then there was like fires in the horizon. And, and then someone was like, uh, oh, I just realized that if we were trying to explain this picture to someone in the future, would we say the mask were for COVID or the fires? Um, it was a very poignant <laughs> like moment. I was like, oh, that is so true. Like that is such a weird picture to be showing to someone who has no context because like, so like you're, you're trying to explain, so you're like, well, we're wearing masks, but that's for something else. That's not this ravaging fire right now, right? And, and that's how I tend to think about world building. I want to think about like what's important in this context, like right now. And so if the masks, the masks are a reaction to something that has changed in the world, what other things have changed, right? The masks are supposed to be a health um, reaction, but there's also social reaction, there's political, there's economical reactions, right? And that's really how I think of it. Often in speculative worlds, it's magic, right? But it's not always magic. Um, in, in David Mogul, for instance, it wasn't magic. It was gods falling to the city of Lagos. That's it. That was the one event. And they sort of like built everything off of that. What changes? What, what, how does the government change? How do the people respond? How, how does the city infrastructure change? Who accepts these gods? Who denies them? Who, you know, like, and what do those mean for the economy, for the politics, for, for the, you know, how does that even filter down to the everyday thing? Um, like, what do they wear? Uh, and that's really how I think about worlds. And I sort of like build off of that one point. Uh, sometimes I add things, but for the most part, I try to think of a central point. For Son of the Storm, I think there were multiple central points. The magic is there, the magic of Ibor is there, but it's not the only thing. I think at the core, it's, it's the way the world is set up right? Um, the way the world is set up with Basa at the center. So Basa is very key to the way the rest of the world operates around Basa. So I had to think about why Basa operates that way and what that means for the rest of Un, which is the continent around it. So um, yeah, that's, that's really how I think about building worlds. Uh, Kate is asking, do you see where your story will go next? Do you have it all planned out or are you still imagining it? How many books will there be in a series? Looking forward to reading your book. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, currently, we have a trilogy planned. So the second book is called Warrior of the Wind. Not officially announced, but like it's in the back of Son of the Storm anyway. Warrior of the Wind is book two. It should be out next summer, I believe. Um, but next year sometime. Um, where do I think it will go next? 
All right, I'm just gonna lay this out. <laughs> um, so the first thing I know is a lot of it will take place outside of Vasa because most of the key characters we're gonna follow are outside of Vasa, but also because some characters without spoiling anything will need to go out of Vasa to get a stronger handle on things. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> non-spoiler way I can put it. Um, so there'll be a lot of seeing what's outside of Vasa and why, how these people exist relative to Vasa. Uh, because everyone looks at Basa as this power. So there, you know, maybe we'll get to see people who who buy into the stories that Basa tells, and maybe those who don't, who are like, yeah, they're just lying. Uh, we know that they don't really have anything, uh, you know, and all that. Um, but the other thing is also more beasts, okay? Um, more magical beasts. <laughs> currently in Son of the Storm. The lightning bat. <laughs> yes, you did not, but yeah. Um, currently in Son of the Storm, we have just one, the lightning bat, mm -hmm. as um, Shannon says. Um, but in book two and three, there'll be more. Um, I have also promised a heist. That's all I will say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I have promised a heist. Uh, I have promised a sentient hurricane. Yeah. So <laughs> those are all promises, by the way. So. Don't hold me to it, but yeah. <laughs> no, all, you need, all you need is heist and ascension hurricane, and honestly, I think you're good. <laughs> yeah, we're in. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Uh, there is this other question up here from Annie from Sydney, Australia. Hi, I'm curious to know whether you read any fantasy books while writing your own epic fantasy, or were you concerned it could impede on your own creative process? Mm. <laughs> I don't know if I would say while, um, like, like during the time I was writing, um, but let's see. Whew. I think, I don't think so. I wouldn't say so. Um, I did read a bunch of books. Um, I have read City of Brass. Like that was one of the ones that <laughs> was like uh, a, a massive um, way to think about worlds. But um, one of the things that I guess I did think, I have read epic fantasy a bunch, but I, I'm not as much, not a lot. Right, because I'm. I, you're right, Annie. I'm always thinking about imbibing some of the things I want to subvert themselves. Um, so I only want to imbibe them on a knowledge level, as opposed to what I start to think as an expectation level. Where when I'm writing, I feel like if I'm not doing that, then I'm not writing epic fantasy right, which isn't true. Um, and so I, I I have read a bunch of epic fantasy to understand what epic fantasy's expectations are, especially coming from the normative um, sources, right? Um, and, and how to sort of like, un, you know, subvert that for what I'm writing, because a lot of what I'm writing and a lot of the multifaceted nature of like what I'm trying to tell sort of goes against what you would expect from a lot of the normative fantasy. Um, and so, yes, I maybe part of that means often I just like uh, involuntarily stayed up, stayed away from that while writing, uh, but I don't think I thought about it. But yes, it probably did um, was a consideration, and I don't think it would impede. If I had read, if anything, it would probably have added to it. But I did see a lot of TV though, um, TV and um, film. So, uh, but it's another medium, um, so it feels different. Um, and I do, I have, I also listened to other fantasy that was not epic, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if you notice, but like a lot of what I write, regardless of like if it's secondary or what, feels very connected to the modern. And, and I think that's the only place where I, I don't mind having these influences of like tackling matters that have modern, mod, you know, contemporary um, impact or resonance. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I wouldn't say I, I actively decided not to, but I think I just probably did not read <laughs> that. Do you get the get the point in like revisions? Like I definitely have a point when I'm on like that third draft where I can't read other books that are close. More because it makes me just realize how unpolished mine is. Like I have definitely <laughs> periods um, 
Two, in particular, when I was working on The Empire of Gold, I read The City We Become um, by N.K. Jemison, which was one yeah. of the best books that I read in my life. And I was like, oh, okay, my, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Again, while trying to draft over this past winter, I read um, Von Ali's Jade War, which blew my mind. And again, I was like, I can't do everything. <laughs> my book currently just says more in capital. More. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a very interesting like, and and, and I guess another thing is, I'm always thinking, for instance, like what what am I doing with my work? And a lot of times, sometimes, I need to necessarily step. Uh, aside from something else that would be more um that would that would be good but different right and it's not what my story should be doing yeah. uh, and I guess yeah that's part of why I would probably not even like even if there was a story I would probably like want to step away from it be, for that reason because I don't want to have to second guess that what I am doing needs to be done not just for my story but for that thing to be done and existing out there in the world um, just as every other thing does so so yeah yeah I can completely see how you would read something and be like oh wait why didn't I do that but then like you know and you don't want to have that wow you're writing right maybe during revisions where you can't change anything you and you yeah. can be like oh well I guess it's not in my hands anymore but yeah we have time for two more questions okay. um one is what unexpected thing did you learn while doing research for this book and did you include it in the story? Ooh, unexpected. Hmm. I would say, contrary to the idea that in fantasy novels, people travel a lot with animals, a lot of people <laughs> did not. They walked a lot. There was a lot of walking. Um, and so one of, one of the things I wanted to do, like in the quest in my book, I was like, do I have them just like canter off on horses and like, we're going on a quest or <laughs> do I have them slug it out? And I chose for, to slug it out um, because that's just what people did. And it turns out like animals are, are very expensive, especially the quality ones that will last you a journey, especially if you're going on a fellowship, right? Of some sort <laughs> on a quest, right? You need a solid animal, you need water sources, you need food, like that all costs money. And, I don't know if this is news, but like money is really hard to come by, <laughs> especially in that time. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people just walked. They just like put stuff on their backs and were like, oh, all right, I'm out of here. And they walked and walked until they found somewhere else. And just sometimes they just stopped, stopped there and started a family or something and started a new settlement. Um, yeah. And so like in book two, a lot, a lot of it is going to talk about trade routes because like outside of Bassa, it's like a lot of trade routes and it's just a lot of random settlements on the trade routes right it's just like walking and then hey some people have, have set up camp here and this is their new place and they're going to call it something and that's it that's really what people did it was very surprising to me um because like fantasy has always taught us that like you know there's this very great horse that goes by a very nice you know mighty name but mostly not mostly people just as i said walked um Sometimes the, the animal they like rode on was like very small, like a, like a donkey's like massive, you know, like something really small. Uh, sometimes they even like carried the animal <laughs> themselves, like a goat, like a goat or something, and then probably ate it down the road. Like all of these things I saw and it was very strange, um, but I guess it was more normal than having folks like have all these um assets yeah so i'm, I'm gonna probably do more of that right? because i did that in some of the storm and i'm gonna do more of that kind of like laborious journey and walking Excellent. plus the sentient <laughs> hurricane seems the rest of the <laughs> uh so our last question tonight uh what was the editing process like for you was there anything that got cut during the editing process and do you think that might find its way back into the story in one of the later books. Hmm. Um, let's see how many words got caught. I think it was like between eight to 10 K words that got caught between That's first it? pass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Between first and final pass. Um, and, and I would say, and a lot of the cutting was me actually. So like mostly my editors, you know, would just point out and be like, are you sure you want to do this? 
more kind of thing like in in the very passive aggressive notes of editors like sure sure about that uh, and then you have to like second guess your whole existence but <laughs> but yeah it was it was more like like that and then I would rethink so I don't think whole things got cut out it was more like okay this can't work I have to rewrite that or like reframe what that means or is for this um and will that make it into the second story? I would say not. Um, Son of the Storm is a very specific story. I don't think, um, yeah, I don't think anything else would make it into other, maybe, maybe it, I don't even know if it could be like a short story as an aside because they're not completely ten tangential. They're actually literally events just that maybe they happened off screen and then they didn't need to happen on screen or, but they are mentioned. So like, it doesn't make sense to like, um, re-represent them in some way it would just be a repetition so i don't think no everything that you're going to see in book two is going to be new um uh and yeah <laughs> let's just say i am hoping to shock you some more <laughs> well we're all on board for that thank you so much to both of you for joining us tonight uh, Sui davies okumbawa's new book is the son of the storm there's links in the chat you can click on to get over to our website, powells.com. And thank you to Shannon Shakabordi for being here in conversation. It was excellent to have you both, and I hope we can host you again in the future. Thank you very much. This was very, very wonderful. Thank you, Shannon. Of thank course. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Powell. Have a good night. Take Thanks. Care. Bye.